it may be relevant to you. Some of you may be thinking, what is FTA? Let's come over and understand and get an overview about it. Whatever in position that you are in, FTA is something being talked about much. When you open a newspaper today, you see there will be a column which definitely talks about FTAs. This was not the case a few years back or a few decades back. But India is moving very aggressively towards free trade agreements. So you, we from the fraternity of consulting or the emerging lawyers or the professionals who are rendering supports to your uh, customers, maybe from a corporate perspective or from a taxation perspective, it is important for us to understand what is this RTAs or FTAs, how it evolves, how it affects. So we will divide the session today into three parts. I am not expecting that everybody are practicing lawyers in the field of tax. So I am assuming there are laymen, there are students, and there are professionals as well. So my responsibility is to make sure that all of you get an overview in the next one hour's time or maximum 90 minutes. So we'll divide the session like and about the institution which creates these provisions across the world that is known as World Customs Organization and a little bit about WTO and their concepts. So this will give us an overview about how this regional trade agreements emerges. And the second aspect then we will move into what position India has, how India's free trade agreements are moving forward and also in the past, how India handled free trade agreements and what are free trade agreements is all about. A little bit of intricacies on uh, the types of agreements which are prevailing. This will also help you to understand when you read a news, when you come across an article like this on free trade agreement, uh, to cope up and to walk along with that. And the third phase, it's a little process oriented. How India has taken precautionary measures, uh, which is affecting the trade, especially the GDP. All of you are aware that how GDP is calculated, right? Consumption, investment, expenditure, plus export minus import. So how these exports and imports are also contributing to GDP and how it is getting affected because of this non-tariff barriers which were created by India. So with these three parts, you will get an overview today and it will help you to further deep dive into the subject if you are interested with it. And uh, since we are all not in person present, I may not be able to ask you questions and I cannot get your responses. And also, I don't want to waste my time in asking questions because we are all unfamiliar uh, faces with each other. So it will be like a pure one-way side. But I'll try to keep as much uh, interesting for you to understand. I will try to avoid all the uh, acronyms and legal jargons so that you relate my talk uh, in a practical way. And I will also substitute a lot of practical examples so for you to understand. And if possible, you keep a notebook and pad and don't rely on recording that you will be watching it, you will never get the time. So just write down and then you can do some research on those topics further. All right, we will get back to the session. If we were present in uh, physical, I would be definitely asking, what do you think about free trade agreement? So some of you will be using these words definitely in the college life, you would have studied free, we means there is no obligation, there is no consideration, trade which means you know what is trade. An agreement is something that a covenant that we make mutually with each other. It could be bilateral, it could be unilateral. That could be the uh, response from a learned lawyer friends. But how this all evolves? Across the globe, post GATT changed over like WTO and WCO. There is a prominent role WTO plays. Members who India is also a member to WTO, we have a binding understanding. How WTO pushes or implements, like you and me get into an agreement and I sign and you sign, it comes into force. WTO agreements doesn't work in that way. It goes based on the numbers. So for example, that we have 168 countries or 183 countries who are part of WTO. So there should be a ratification process, meaning two third majority needs to sign. So out of 168 countries, if two third majority of the people are signing an agreement, that is known as a ratification date or entry in force date. So the day that the 30, um, two third countries are signing, the day that we achieve that mark, that day is known as entry in force date. So WTO 
agreements comes into force on that day and it is binding and if any country violates any agreement then the other members having the right to complain about it to wto so wto will send a team to that particular country it towards a consultative approach so they come and they ask you we have received an allegation against you like this what do you have to say now if you are in a position to accept the allegation and try to do the course correction there ends the matter suppose if a country i'm using a word member member is equal to country suppose if a member says no our position is right we don't want to change our position then wto can go back and constitute something known as dsp which is dispute settlement panel a 13 country members will be constituted and they will investigate the matter and they will give a report within 90 days and whatever the report comes out that is binding the other country needs to take action against it and all the member countries will be following that panel's discussion now uh, some of you may be aware recently agriculture agreement our country giving subsidies our government giving subsidies to exporters so this was complained against india in wto so there is an agreement in wto known as subsidies and countervailing measures uh, agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures in which there is an article 3.2 b which talks about any time when a country, a developing country, moves to a developed country, how do we say that a developing country moves to a developed country? That agreement says, if a country's GNP cr crosses over $1,000 per capita, that means that country is no more a developing country, it becomes a developed country for the purpose of this agreement. So India, for that purpose, that we cross the threshold, the moment we cross the threshold, we become developed country. So other developed country complained against India. So they went to the government and they made a lot of approaches. Our government was very firm. And that was the reason most of the post-export incentive schemes which were announced by the government under the foreign trade policy got reversed. Some of you may be familiar with MEIS, SEIS, EOUs. EHTP, EPCG, SEZ, what this agreement says, all these benefits India is offering to their trade are to incentivize them directly or indirectly to boost their exports. So that is not acceptable to WTO. So India has no other choice but to relook into our post-export incentive schemes. And they said, okay, we will be complied. And they changed it to something known as RODTEP, RODSEL. For the service rot cell, for the support of exports, it is rot. That is not the discussion today. This is to tell you how powerful a WTO institution, which is having a binding force on the members. Now you will understand WTO is not an institution which can only create policies. It can also enforce it and it is binding in nature and has implications. We have an option to further appeal it in WTO. We have appealed it, but of course, all of you know, Trump, Mr. Trump did not agree to give additional judges in the appellate forum, and that has slightly become a uh, handicap now. So WTO appellate forum is not working efficiently. Does that mean WTO lost its sanctity and it's no more working? It is working, but as I rightly said, it may not be that effective because we could have taken a position saying that, okay, I don't agree with your view, I have appealed it further. When a matter is pending uh, decision before an appellate forum, probably no country could enforce an agreement or enforce a decision. But still India understood, yes, what was the gap, what was the DSP opined, and then what was the uh, WTO verdict came against us. And we took steps to change the process. So this is history. Even 2022, we reconciled with the US and settled couple of discussions, uh, whatever the disputes which were pending in WTO, that is all history now. Now, why I'm quoting this? Post-1991, we had an economy called globalization, liberalized economy. What does it mean? The concept of MFN, most favored nation concept, which is, a, which is a main driving force of WTO, was very prevalent among all the countries. For those of you who are not very familiar with what is MFN, MFN means, in a very simple way to understand, 
if i render a benefit to one country who's my neighbor for example sri lanka if i tell sri lanka that i'll be charging duties only for you at 10% for rest of the world it is 20% that is unfair so the mfn concept restricts to bring out a fairness in charging duty so if india decides to charge duty on uh, import goods 10% to sri lanka equally that is applicable to across members in the world this is mfn however that same wto has given a relaxation to the members to create regional trade agreements under article 24 when we say 24 is roman 24 under article roman 24 this article helps members to create mutual recognition that is i and sri lanka can have a bilateral agreement i and another few countries can have multilateral agreement so that kind of a rights are available which means that benefit which i give a preferential benefit it is only applicable to those countries with which that i have this agreement not for everybody so you see the concept of mfn and this but the concern is now today globally there are 350 plus such agreements prevailing if 300 agreements are prevailing in the world with a concept of regional trade agreement then what is the purpose of mfn that's a big concern which we need to look into it but of late with you see countries are moving away from globalization to a kind of protectionism you have started protecting themselves by invoking section 301 of the trade act they went against heavily towards china which we all seen witnessed how sanctions have been implicated against china so every country for the ma- matter european union even india in many occasions we were also trying to become very closed economy for various reasons one of the big reasons that we can demonstrate there is a, a regional countries designated with an acronym called asean a s e a n these 10 countries where india is also party to it try to include another six countries and create a mechanism called rcep regional cooperation economic partnership this was primarily mooted by china and india was also participating in a lot of discussion but finally modi government walked out from rcep so now asean members 10 plus 5 members all put together 15 members are party to rcep except india many of the countries wants india to come and join with them so this is how block wise agreements are being made you can see nafta which i'll be explaining a couple of uh, major uh, mega trade agreements in a while before, after you understand the concepts little bit so okay now i gave a brief about how wto has a power to allow members to create regional trade agreements okay article roman 24 is evident for this you can read it by yourself uh to get some more clarity into it now when we talk about trade in india there are two big governments coming in two big sorry not governments two big government department coming in one is commerce another one is finance so ministry of finance has a body called department of revenue under department of revenue you have direct tax and indirect tax so direct tax goes against uh, all the income tax related matters and the indirect tax comes under customs and gst these are the two taxes which we call it as indirect tax on the other side ministry of commerce they have a department called director general of foreign trade who then decides how the country's outward policy inward policy looks like so they create a five year plan they create a policy which is known as foreign trade policy so there is a policy in your left hand and there is a customs who are supposed to implement the policy decisions in the right hand so these both goes trade hand in hand without ministry of commerce customs cannot function without customs ministry of commerce cannot function these two works together to bring out a tangible uh, boundaries uh, to cut short uh, services goods what comes in what goes out and they also take responsibility to implement other government agencies whoever in our country creating a law even they are enforcing that as a nodal bodies at the border this gives you an understanding of w uh, customs and ministry of commerce ministry of commerce primarily deal with wto institution 
any any trade agreements anything to be negotiated it will be completely done in consultation with other concerned department but it will be primarily the faces ministry of commerce but ministry of finance department of revenue where you have cbic and cbdt that is central board of indirect tax and the central board of direct tax that bodies are known as customs they are directly affiliated as a member to wco world customs organization which is an intergovernmental organization doesn't have any uh, greater binding on countries this was established in 1952 uh, as customs cooperation council okay now in 2004 5 onwards it is also renamed as wco now why i'm giving this background for you as an emerging lawyers need to understand the difference between wto and wco so one is very powerful and binding the other one is an institution which is created purely as an independent intergovernmental body to enable the efficiency or to bring out uh, they they give tools they give guidance they give a lot of directives to different countries all the members needs to adopt it in simple terms you may ask what are those for example how to develop an international conventions instruments or commodity classification which is known as hsn valuation rules collection of revenue and uh, supply chain security international trade facilitation enforcement activities ipr ipr means not ipr that comes under trips trips and this is ipr enforcements and drugs enforcement illegal weapon tradings integrity promotion such and such things are driven by wco okay so if any lawyer in the country if they wanted to claim that i at a point in time that i need to be an expert in customs all you need to remember only three pillars number 1 hs classification harmonized system of classification that is known as hs classification maybe another time we'll talk about what is hs and how this hs evolved what is the principles of classification in another time the second one is valuation customs valuation the third one is rules of origin so these are the three pillars of customs if you understand these three pillars and if you master it you will be recognized as a lawyer across the globe not only in india across the globe because it is all identical rules across the country across the globe so what are the three things one is hs code classification the second one is customs valuation rules and the third one is rules of origin that is what we are dealing with it today now the hs belongs to wco which means it is their baby what needs to come inside what needs to be removed what needs to be added is in complete control of world customs organization that was even adopted by customs also by gst in india so if you have some interest you can also understand how to do commodity classification and it is defining their boundaries only for commodity classification the second pillar which i talked about is customs valuation which is an offshoot of gat article 7 roman 7 gat article roman 7 which in india implemented as customs valuation rules so this is completely offshoot of wto gat agreement but administered by wco that is where you need to have a clarity the original article belongs to gat which is wto now that article is completely administered by technical administration is done by wco likewise the third one article roman 24 again a wto article administered by wco so if you see in this context there are three pillars and we are today talking about one important pillar that is regional trade agreements now regional trade agreement how do we understand generally the word free trade agreement right the word free trade agreement the word free trade agreement it encompasses scope which includes gats which includes trims which also includes trips trade related investment measures trade related intellectual property and gats general agreement on services so it comprises of gat goods and services investments and also property 
and other trade related issues so which means a free trade agreement will have a larger and deep comprehensive aspects incorporated into it for example the trans pacific partnership or even the nafta north american free trade uh, european union free trade agreements are a typical example to get relating yourself to see what is trade agreements but today what we need to understand as an emerging uh, students with a lot of enthusiasm to know international trade the first word that you need to write down is called preferential trade agreement pta any time when i do a business it is very narrower i will not tell another country i will completely eliminate the tariff sorry for using the word tariff for those of you not familiar what is tariff for you tariff means as a set of uh, some instructions no tariff means entire world commodities are classified into chapter 1 to 98 which i told you as hs convention is brought out hs and harmonized system of nomenclature how do we understand this in a very simple way for example all of you are currently using your pc right now today uh, maybe your college principal telling you hey guys come and bring the laptop get me the laptop so you go and carry the machine and go and give it to your principal in your office somebody will say hey, go and get my desktop you will be thinking okay desktop cannot be removed that's a big machine uh, are you referring to the personal computer are you referring to the pc so use an acronym called pc so while ago we said laptop you go to some other far east countries they don't use either of this word they use hey go to my terminal so they use a word called terminal now if for one product across india across globe if different geographical is giving a different nomenclature which means a different description to a product how will you and me will understand for example you are importing some goods from a particular country in those country they say 500 dell terminal 500 dell pcs we call it as they call it as 500 dell terminal the goods comes into india customs officer will look into it and he will say what does it mean dell terminal terminal means what i know like a wire or a conductor which has an end which is known as terminal any end is known as terminal but here i am confused to get me the catalog so that's how the confusions will come in order to eradicate this confusion wco brought out a kind of a nomenclature which they say automatic data processing machine that is a heading adp machine okay under which you can have sub classifications pc uh, servers anything which gives a device which is giving an input or a processor cpu and an output which is printer so this is how the commodity classification have been classified now when you wanted to import anything you can choose the right code and you put it across the globe everyone will understand what you have imported so in order to eradicate this word we use the uh, nomenclature or we use the standards which is known as if there is a commodity which is defined in two digit we call it as chapter if it is de defined in four digits we call it as as heading if it is devised as six digits we call it as sub heading then on an eight digit we call it as tariff item so i am referring to this tariff so in the pta agreement this tariff what we have around 5000 approximately 400 tariff items will not be exposed to the other country rather i will create a positive list and i will say okay let's practically take india and sri lanka are the country okay you are sri lanka and i am india now i come to you with a small list look i want you to consider these items coming into your country with a lower duty sri lanka will say okay fine so then you india please consider these items positive list because my country is producing these items which can be exported into your country so kindly give us duty concession so pta starts with the word called concession not exemption exemption means for everyone it is 100 for you is zero that is exempt i am exempting you completely concession is rather it will go in a periodical manner i may say okay in 2023 let's have uh, 75% next year 24 we will have 50% and the following year we will reduce it to 25 and the following year it can become zero so i can reduce step by step which i call it as concession so always the preferential trade agreements will be on a particular focused areas something like quotas so it is less comprehensive unlike fta and mostly it is reciprocal you give something and i give something 
A better example, what you can uh, relate is GSP is another uh, non-reciprocal tariff, which on which Mercosur tariff. These are the Mercosur is a country in North America. As you know, five countries are together, which we call it as Mercosur, M E R C O S U R. So this is how preferential trade agreements can be entered, only for duty concession, only for positive list. When this relationship emerges to the next level, we call that as SIPA. It's not SICA. We call that as SICA. What is SICA? Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement. It's comprehensive Economic. I am cooperating with another country, which is known as Cooperation Agreement. So generally, besides goods, besides goods, I will also add services, which means besides GATT, I will also add GATS, GATS. So I will also add other elements in the services. This is known as Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement. India has a few cooperation agreements. Then when this gets matured, it will become a partnership agreement. Only that C will become a P. The cooperation will become a partnership. When I move into a partnership agreement, probably it's pretty large. Even I will even think about moving people beyond investment, migrating people and uh, services from one place to another place, mode one, two, three, four, all will get kicked in. This is how FTA, PTA, SICA, SIPA. These are the four words you need to keep in your mind. Due to paucity of time that I cannot go into each and every agreements in detail. So I'll try to capture as much that I can. Globally, we also have mega trade agreements, mega trade agreements for trans-Pacific agreements, trans-Atlantic, whichever the countries which are positioned in the rim of the trans-Atlantic ocean, you know, all these countries are joined together and they have trans-Atlantic trade and investment partnership and RSUP, which I have already explained. For students, for you to understand a little more in detail, I will take one union and try to explain, see whether you could be able to comprehend this. Customs union. Now, when I move from Singapore to Malaysia, I'm sure most of you would have traveled. By road, we can move from here to Malaysia. Okay, why do you go to Singapore? You could just go from here to Pakistan. When you move from here to Pakistan or when you move from here to Bangladesh, you face a border. In the border, that it is, there is a customs which asks you to file a declaration to follow a set of process and then they impose duty and then you are allowed to go to the other country on completion of the process. So there is a barricade which is created. So any country that we cross from one place to another place, this customs plays a role. Now, when there is no boundaries, how, how it looks like, for example, you can go to Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Bhutan, Maldives. If it becomes one union, there is only one customs, one guidance that is exactly happening in European Union. The trade under zero duty, which means you take any goods from here to there, bring any goods from there to there, zero duty. 28 countries had this union. Uh, now Brexit, UK moved out. So which means 27 countries are having this union. There are absolutely no duty on movement of goods. And how this evolves into the second level, which is known as common market from a customs union, this is moving to the next level called common market. Customs union is to facilitate free movement of labor. You see from goods that we are moving to labor. Then we also move to capital. We also move to technical standards. You see, in addition to goods, I am allowing my people. Like, that's like, you know, you take a flight and go from here to Bombay, Bombay to Bangalore, Bangalore to here. There is no questions asked. You go there and you work, you earn and you come back. You give your service, you give your support and you come back. So people can move, laborers can move from one place to another place without my immigration. Capitals, you can invest and they can invest. Technical standards, for example, in India, we say that, okay, if such and such products are coming from China, we need to have meet that Indian standards, ISI. The Bureau of Indian Standards puts these ISIs and say, unless substandard products are coming in, we will not permit that to get penetrated into India. FSA. The food safety authorities, we say, if any food goods comes into India, it has to meet certain testing standards. So within that common market, all the standards are harmonized, which means one standard is sufficient all across this union. And the third one, when it matures further, European Union is the best example for us to visualize. The common market further extends uh, legislative institutions, which means European Court of Justice. See, for example, Italy has a court. Germany has a court. 
Now, Italy gives a verdict. Germany need not to follow it. Germany can have its own jurisprudence. But here, one common court, which says European Court of Justice, if they rule it, all the 27 countries will have to follow that. Judicial services are shared. Executives have shared. Even the fiscal and monetary policies are common across the economic union. So it becomes one economic union. That means you will have one currency. You will be more powerful in that region to negotiate a deal with anybody else. And that is why even day before yesterday, European Union struck, uh, has a deal with New Zealand. European Union had a deal with Vietnam, the emerging economy, not with India. India, they're struggling. I will explain why they are not able to crack a deal with India but how they could do 100% exposure of Vietnam tariffs, which means what Vietnam is saying, all my tariff I open for you, come over. Everything is zero duty or everything is based on whatever that they've agreed sensitive list. Uh, European Union also have a large trade agreement with African continent, which comprises of 53 countries. So which means where this world is moving towards completely a paradigm shift from globalization to a protectionist economy. It is between two countries or between two regions. So this is how the uh, shift is taking place. So let's now understand a little bit more in detail. What are the agreements India currently having? So India has something known as bilateral agreements, regional agreements, unilateral agreements. These are the three things which you need to keep in mind. What are the three things? One is bilateral, which means I, another country, it is bilateral, regional, which means ASEAN is a typical example, SAFTA is another example, South Asian uh, free trade agreements, all the South Asian countries will come under that, ASEAN, <clears throat> AAFTA, they call it as India, India, ASEAN, India, free trade agreements, and unilateral schemes, this is something very interesting, which you will uh, have to understand, three things are there with India, number one, when we make an agreement with another country, what is the fundamental basic element that we look into it? Basic fundamental element. I explained to you a while ago, HS code, harmonized system of codings. All of you are seated in your uh, table. Now, the table, my table is made of wood. W-O-O-D, wood, right? From where did this wood come from? Somewhere... Um, tree fell down. Someone cut a tree. Someone fell a tree and from there the wood is taken and it is shaped into a table. Right? Okay. Now, in the commodity tariff, if you classify, I told you every product in the world can get classified under chapter 1 to chapter 98. Wood can be classified under chapter 44. All woods, all type of woods, you know, pine tree, different, different trees, teak, everything can be classified there. So, a tariff item in a particular country, for example, Kenya. Kenya is producing trees, pine trees, and they cut it wood. Kenya is exporting or Kenya bringing that wood as a raw material, and then they do a processing. What, is proce what does processing mean? They manufacture from the wood by doing a cutting, sawing. They create an article out of that wood, table, chair. Any furnished articles will be classified under Chapter 95 in the HSN Commodity Classification, which means a four-digit shift 44 to 95, it is changing. That is known as change in HS code, which means I have completely used my labor, my resources, and I produced a different article. Article A became Article B. The material A became material B and I created a value in my country. So now I claim that as origin belongs to my country. There could be crops where it is 100% wholly originated from your country. There you don't need to add any regional value content substance. So when I enter an agreement with another country, I will say, Sri Lanka, if there is a goods wholly produced in your origin, I will believe that and I will give benefit. It should not happen. Dubai is sending some goods to Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka is bringing that into India, which means that becomes smuggling. That means I'm weakening my agreement. 
So my agreement primarily says if it is originating from your country, I am willing to consider a concessional preferential rate of duty. Same time, everything may not be wholly produced. The example which I gave, from a tree, we create an article. Likewise, using certain raw materials, you can create an article. There are times you may not have articles in your country. For example, we are using one country is manufacturing, let's say, mobile phone, Korea. Korea says that I, in a mobile phone, in a very simple way, there is a display, there is a PCB, there is a battery, and there is a keyboard, and there is a charger. Five uh, components makes one mobile phone. Korea says, I have everything except battery. Battery I need to import from Malaysia. So, which means without battery, it is not a cell phone. India has a demand for cell phone. So, what we tell Korea, as long as the value addition meets 35%, as long as you are meeting a value addition of 35%, I'm good to go with it. But if you are not able to meet that value addition, then I'm not going to give you the benefit. I will not consider that goods originated from your country. It is somebody else's country product rooted through your country, which is against our agreement. So, this is how an agreement is arranged. There are methods in which that you can calculate this RSV, regional value content. It may be direct method, indirect method, all that is a uh, very deep procedural thing. Definitely, I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, if you're interested, even there are a lot of enormous materials which are available to calculate it. You can read it, but at least we wanted to understand the concept now. So now this agreement may, if it is originating from this country or if it meets that value addition criteria, I will consider that as an origin. Suppose you may ask the question, there are 10 countries comprises of ASEAN. What if, if one country manufactures and sends that final product to another country, that becomes a component for that other country. And that country adds certain more spares and that becomes a semi-finished product. And that country sends it to another country within that ASEAN country. And finally, that country makes the final product and sends it to India, which is the origin which is the origin in which that it is coming, whether this ASEAN concept permits that within that block, if you are moving it, it is permitted. But if it is imported from Europe, it is not permitted. So this is how customs will check any time when there is a goods comes into India from where it is originated. Does that product meets that originating criteria or not? These are the checks and balances customs does it at the origin sensitive for our country because we have domestic market we cannot straight away make it zero but periodically we make it zero and they we also keep something known as exclusion list meaning we will never negotiate this because it is very very sensitive or beyond sensitive we are not prepared to negotiate any discussion with your country so this is how we have categorization which will come under any bilateral agreement which means me and another country will have a bilateral agreement I told you how many such agreements are there with India. Now I will show you a screen in my so that you will be able to see my PowerPoint. And India have bilateral agreements with 12 countries. Probably uh, the latest edition is Australia. Even Australia is also added into it. So now I, I had specified the year in which that we entered into that agreement. And I used a word very specifically FTA. Then SIPA. Can anyone tell me what is SIPA and SIKA? Okay, what does FTA stands for? Can anyone tell me? Am I talking to the ghost? Is there anyone to respond to me saying, what does FTA stands for? Yeah, FTA is free trade agreements. Okay. And uh, SIKA is, I think, sulfur emission control area. S-E-C-A. I'm not sure about SIKA. All right. Uh, did you listen to this explanation which I gave it to you all a while ago or you joined a little later? Okay, those who, have, those who are following me from the beginning, I had explained to you what is Sika. Just maybe you would have made some note in your diary. What is Sika and Sipa? Sika stands for, I told you how it all emerges, no? Now you can relate it. Uh, India, Chile, serial number 7, you see PTA, that is Preferential Trade Agreement. When that moves to the next level, which is known as Sika, CECA, Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement. You can see serial number 4, Malaysia, serial number 9, Singapore we have this comprehensive economic cooperation agreement. And then with Korea and Japan, we have comprehensive economic partnership agreement. Have you understood now? So this is how there are a lot of uh, these old treaties like 1950s with Nepal. The latest one is 2022. Now I would 
have you all taken note of this? I'll just go and give you some interesting facts further to that. We also have something known as unilateral agreements, which means the world can be divided into three parts, developed country, developing country, and least developed country. So Mr. Modi goes to Afghanistan and say that I'm going to give you $100 million, which means there is no reciprocal from the other side. I voluntarily go and I go and say, I will do this for your country and I come back, which means it is unilateral. The moment I say bilateral, which means I give something and I expect something from you. So when there is no expectation, it is unconditional, then it is known as unilateral. For example, in uh, the ancient scriptures where it says even the Jews, the Israelites were fighting the war, even till date, they follow something known as mosaic law. Mosaic law. The whole country is fighting for that one mountain, right? That mountain was known as a temple built by Solomon. Uh, Islam is claiming that we also had uh, Muhammad ascended from here. So if these two people are, why they are giving so much important, both of them, they got a law from their leader, which is known as mosaic law. That law says, if you do this, you will receive this blessing. But if you violate this, you will be cursed by God. You see, this is how the, the, the agreement goes to one party with a condition. If you violate the condition, these are the reprimanded uh, that I can invoke against you. So the other side, uh, if you see the same Israel, uh, by 2000 years back, they still they don't accept Christianity as part of any of their religion. But there is a group among the world which says Christianity, Jesus came and he said that I paid all the price for everyone, every mankind sin. And whoever believes in me will have eternal life. Now, this is unilateral, which means anyone who believes will have eternal life. You don't need to do anything. Surprising, but that is the power of unilateral. So, which means I don't expect anything from you. I have done it generously and you have to just receive it and use it. That's it. Mr. Modi goes and gives 100 million to another country. All you have to do is do it, receive it and use it. No questions asked. That is where we have a lot of doubts. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. For you to keep these two things in mind, you need to keep like this. One more thing, all of you lawyers need to take a note of it here. Post 2011, there are no Okay, forget about the small Afghanistan and the Bhutan. There are, they are just a simple bilateral agreement. It is not a major FTAs. There is no big deals made between India and any of the countries. You know why anybody thought about it? Ever since this government comes into the power, the first time Mr. Piyush Goel, the current uh, Minister of Commerce, when he took charge, he's a rank holder, he's a chartered accountant, very good in numbers. The first time when he took charge of his office, he said, bring these agreements. I would like to review it. Because he took charge exactly at a time in which that RCEP, India uh, refused to join with RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic pa uh, Partnership, which, uh, the, which was uh, muted by China. And that was a time when he reviewed all the agreements. Every agreements presented to him having trade deficits, which means every agreements that we enter other than uh, the unilateral agreement, supposed to be resulting in trade surplus. For example, you and me are two countries. I give something, which means I export some goods to you. You supposed to give me dollars. You export something to me. I supposed to give you dollars. So that should be the balance of trade needs to be surplus, trade surplus, right? Every country wants to do that. But all of our agreements are trade deficit. That is when he wanted to go and cancel that agreement or to renegotiate that agreement. He took a lot of time. And that was the price still it is lingering. Why? Because we are very clear. We learned from our past mistake that we can never get into an agreement where it will be unfavoring India. So that, that is how the negotiations are still taking place. And it is very, very positive sign that we might enter into an agreement, but in our terms, not in their terms. Earlier, that was not the case. All right. If this, you, you, it, why I'm sharing this is you should be able to track this uh, whenever that you see newspapers. All these things are coming on a daily basis. It will be with regional agreements. I've told you in the beginning itself, ASEAN. We have 10 countries. We have regional agreements. We have APTA. We have SAFTA. We have Indo India Mercosur. 
and GSP. So these are the five regional agreements that we have. So altogether, if anyone wants to do some little deep diving, you should know we have 12 bilateral agreements. It may have some different names. I have also explained why those names are given. We have 34 unilateral agreements with all these least developed country. And we have these five trade agreements. Okay. Any doubts for anyone till now? Now we will see how a comprehensive economic partnership agreement, the highest form of agreement between India and Japan, how does it look like? If you see this uh, agreement, the first line denotes trade in goods, trade in goods. But the second line onwards, if you see, there is a shift which is taking place. It also brings into it regulations, that is the procedures, SPS, services, movement of natural person from one country to another country. We can go and investment, IPR, government procurement, even competition law, business environment, cooperation and dispute settlements. These many things have been factored within a SIPA. It is not only goods. Though we say free trade agreement for goods, our understanding should be like this. How trade and services goes? Uh, today, if a nurse works in India and she earns per month 20000 the same effort she puts in, she might earn at least more than $15,000 in another country. So she can go from here and work in Japan and earn that money and come back. <clears throat> Telecommunication services. All these things were detailed. Natural person. For example, you are a lecturer. You are a, you are a teacher of yoga. You are very good in your hospitality industry. Or you can teach music. Now, you can you teach music or you teach something here. People will pay you 500 rupees uh, for a month. You just move from here to another country under this agreement. You spend there and do the consultation, give the teaching and come back here. And you will be able to gain more money and they will be able to gain more arts. This is how the bilateral things uh, moves on. The nurse's example, caretaker. <clears throat> IPR the same way, trademarks. So this is how the Kappa will have the tariff reductions done. So these are the classifications. What we are saying is tariff for B5 will get eliminated within six installments, which means day one, I will not make it zero, but over the period of time, I will make it zero. So this is how we just classify uh, products under different categories. And the last line which you see is excluded, which means I am not prepared to do any negotiation with you. <clears throat> then we just take an overview about the comprehensive partnership with Korea the same way. It also has anti-dumping and safeguard measures incorporated into it. Trade facilitation measure, telecommunication, movement of natural person, audio-visual cooperation, investment, competition, IPR, bilateral dispute settlement. Okay, so this is how uh, the agreements looks like, tariff elimination. The latest one in 2022, this government brought out is known as UAE. If you are uh, knowing UAE for Dubai alone, probably it's high time that you can read it. Even... Your services, law services, consulting services also can be traded across. This is a very deep agreement. If you see the agreement, comprehensive, uh, comprehensive agreement, which will cover trade in goods, origin, services, TBT, SPS, dispute settlement, same like natural person moving, telecom, customs procedures, pharmaceutical, government procurement, IPR, investment, digital. So I think this is one of the biggest comprehensive agreement that we have with UAE government recently concluded in 2022. Almost UAE has given 7,500 tariff lines. So this is this is such a robust agreement. In simple terms, 95% and above products were completely opened. So which means you should also consider looking into do some tradings as well. The Australia, which again got uh, concluded, maybe you should see that. How do you understand where do you get this information? If you go to this portal called India Trade Portal, and if you go and choose a particular agreement, that portal itself will tell you what kind of a percentage of value additions has to be invoked and uh, what are the agreements, all these details. In case if you are having further interest, you can just use this uh, portal, indiatradeportal.in. So while we were doing like this, an agreement, uh, now I'm stopping the screen and trying to give you some of the uh, different perspective. While we were going through this way, many countries started exploiting the loopholes in the agreement and trying to create losses for our exchequer, for India. One typical example is, I don't want to name the product, uh, from a country, neighboring country, 
the country's complete capacity to produce, let's say, 1,000 metric tons of X product. But our data shows that country exported 4,000, which means 4,000 metric tons of products every year into India. Are you following me? If I have 100 coconut trees, each coconut tree produces, let's say, 10 coconuts. 100 into 10 is the total coconut that I can produce in my country. If I need to ex export except minus domestic consumption, the remaining will get exported. If this is how my quantum of uh, capacity, if I started exporting 1 million coconut from my country, what does it sound? It is not produced, obviously, in my country, but someone else pushing that coconut into my country and exporting it through my country to claim the benefit. If you are there in Bombay, uh, recently uh, you would have seen a shop in every mall called Future Group, Big Bazaar. Every time when you go sometime back, uh, maybe five years back, if you go to a big bazaar, there will be a lot of beautiful garments. You will be wondering, for me to stitch a shirt, I'm paying 200, 300, 500 rupees. How they can sell such a beautiful garment for 600, 700 rupees in discounts. It is a complete, very typical good example for smuggling. Dubai and Singapore moving goods to Vietnam. And from Vietnam, these were all moved into India through Bangladesh landlocked area and using the SAFTA agreement. Because there is no duty. So the entire duty savings have been well structured moving it's through this law. particular country. And our country enjoyed the importers who were importing. They enjoyed duty benefits. They exploited the loopholes. That is when they arrested the CFO of Future Group and they reprimanded him, collected differential duty, interest, redemption fine and penalty from these people. And that's how now you don't see any such shop selling that kind of a garment. You may be wondering what happened to Future Group. These are all the reason, you know, how people exploit the good intended benefits for given to a country. So government said, if I know this particular country is exporting excess which they could able to produce. So the DRA, Department of uh, Revenue Intelligence, wrote a lot of emails, a lot of investigations initiated. But do you think the other country will accept their mistake? Because you are questioning the sovereignty of another democracy, right? It is not so easy for an institutional investigation agency to question the sovereignty of another country. So they couldn't do anything. They came back to India and they said, okay, anyway, my responsibility is to protect my country. So the best way is I create some kind of a rule within my country and I try to protect. So they introduced a new rule in India in 2020. This is quite strange, but it is only there in India called Customs Administration Rules Origin Trade called in simple terms called Karota 2020. What does it mean in simple terms what I want you to uh, understand? They made a small amendment in the Customs Tariff, uh, Customs Act. And in that act, what they have done, Section 28DA, where they have they have the powers to do that. So they, I'm just reading that uh, act. Section 28DA was inserted. It provides the procedure to claim preferential duty on import of originating goods under free trade agreement. Verification by the officer and circumstances for rejecting of claim. The provision casts certain obligation on importer to possess sufficient information. This is a very vital word which the government brought in under the Act. And what does it mean? Vital information called sufficient information. In the past, in the past, all government wants a simple certificate called certificate of origin. If one exporting country gives the certificate of origin, I trust and I give the benefit. Now, the government says, you need to have sufficient information about your shipper. Which are the raw material that is being produced, which is being procured from their country? Which are the raw materials which they have imported from elsewhere? You should have that information. And you need to calculate the regional value content. Does it meeting the rules of origin? If it is not happening, I have powers to reject. So instead of going and fighting with another country, I decided to come put a control. It is a barrier. It is a barrier. But I have no other choice. But one or two people made this mistake. 
entire country entire trade is reprimanded so that is powerful this rule is in, introduced in india currently and most of the trade are currently suffering so you lawyers have very good uh, opportunities so now you can read about free trade agreements and you can see there is a lot of confusion which is arising on this ground so you can represent to the government you can uh, file petitions you can go and go on an appeal you can go to the first appeal you can go to second appeal you can go to supreme court so you have another new trade which can get created besides your civil and criminal practice or from the tax this is something emerging and this will likely to stay for a while and uh, it is an opportunity as well the rest are all procedures in karotar probably you may not be enjoying it uh, maybe if we happen to uh, deal another session we will be able to go deep into the procedural aspect so what i intend to uh, explain to you from the beginning to summarize it we have the first part <clears throat> the two big giants wco and wto the differentiation between these two and who owns what i had explained who functionally controls who administratively controls what are the provisions that they are doing it how this mfn gives an advantage over uh, article 24 where the government itself allowing you to have regional trade agreements as well so that we have seen and uh, how uh, bilateral uh, unilateral agreements are there types free trade agreement pt agreement cca and cpa we have seen in a very macro level not in deep and how many agreements india has it and what are those agreements how those agreements are structured where do you find this information and what is the current position of india and how india is now treating the trade so till this point we got a we gave a overview and uh, i'm sure with this you should be able to do some little bit of deep diving if you have some interest follow the news which is going to happen between india and uk india between japan and india israel and so many countries are in the pipeline uh, doing this kind of a free trade agreement with india so now on you will be able to read the text and you will be able to have some relevance to those meanings and you will be able to enjoy that many participants wanted to ask this what is the scope in this area always this question is posed by the students so Oh, okay. What for, is the scope for lawyers? Yeah, as I told you, um, in law, if you go, you know, uh, all of your lawyers and you have mentors, you have college uh, uh, CRs, they will be giving you a better insights. There are some people very specifically focusing on certain small domains, and they will master into it. Uh, you all know Maslow's law. You need to have ten thousand hours put in in a particular law to achieve a mastery level position. So. uh some people they say why do i restrict myself in a particular domain i want to become a corporate lawyer so that i understand everything so you chip in from one law to another law and you wanted to know everything so a lot of people they focus on corporate law a corporate lawyer also having a they may not have a mastery but they will know everything so they can handle mna and other related things some they choose civil some they choose criminal some they move in but there is one domain which is known as though in india it is known as indirect taxation but globally this is known as international trade this international trade which i told you three pillars of customs as long as air and sea as long as trade is there customs is going to be there disputes are going to be there so litigations are slowly moving into an adr side globally people are not interested because the machineries are not effective in delivering the uh, results timely so adr is taking a alternative course but on the other side since now we become very protectionist earlier when i was in a globalization mode when i i used to liberalization concepts but now i wanted to put checks and balances which means india currently having 56 post uh, pgs participating government agencies to name a few for example sites uh, uh, this adc additional drug control cds so fsa ad um, uh, animal quarantine plant quarantine you know you can keep on stacking like this legal metrology all these agencies are defining their laws and there is one authority which is controlling this that is customs though customs have a lot of goals to automate it a lot of ais have come in faceless have come in but still the trade 1.4 billion is our population we have 2 million registered import export codes in uh, dgft we have as of today 1.50 lakhs importers in this country 1.50 lakhs these are the importers and exporters who are dealing business with india these are the potential target scopes for you because everyone are now trying to see how we can get preferential rate of duty and the half of the things are concepts rules of origins are concept half of the things are procedural 
you as a lawyer don't need not to go into the procedural part of it for which customs brokers and other people are there but on the conceptual level determining an origin is a biggest challenge though i have not spoken much about cumulative methods because as a first session you know i don't want to bombard you with a lot of information europe it is a big advance ruling culture which is prevailing in europe we say advance ruling we can afford to litigation in those countries litigation cost is very high so what they say is our core competency is to do business we will focus in business before we initiate a business we will ask you a question that is known as in advance i'll ask you you tell me where do i classify what is the value acceptable which is the origin these three things every year european union having this kind of an advance ruling filings so you draft and you ask a question and they give an answer it is binding on you only not your neighbor so which means there are plenty of advance ruling concepts every country member country in which that you can uh, practice on customs hsn customs valuation and rules of origin in india there is a huge opportunity because india is filled with a lot of mediocres so professionals can come inside and professionals can steer that space and maybe the next 10 years maybe the next 10 years is an opportunity subsequent to that the bots and other things will configure this concepts automatically into it and then probably we may lose the <clears throat> future Uh, that is a threat which is available for every practice but in this practice also i should give you both sides so these are the current scopes where you can uh, play the game in india as well as in the global stage also in the chat box advocate yogesh is asking for study material and other people you can just go to google cbic cbic.gov.in is a website this belongs to customs you can go there and you can just put karota or free trade you will get all the free trade agreements how you should learn is you take one agreement asean agreement or sapta take one agreement okay read the text the so number one there will be a framework between two countries you will see a framework which anyway i'll share it with malvika and once the framework is there you see what are the uh, non tariff notification issued for that particular framework that is a rule so it's under the delegated legislation that we call it as uh, a rule right that rule defines between these two country what are the requirements very clearly explained you take one that is more than enough for you to create a good understanding on that and the rest of the things are procedures uh, what are the notifications which are the tariff items which will go under this which will not go under this that's how it will be there so this will be very helpful and also government has issued brochure brochures uh, with faqs karota uh, free trade agreements that you can go through it and you will also see my material coming into you as well okay sir in the registration form there was one question what are the barriers that come to these trade agreements okay uh, barriers see there are two barriers one is tariff barriers one is non tariff barriers right what is tariff barrier i have a bound uh, uh, i have a responsibility with the wto bound rate of duty i cannot have my duty more than 40% though earlier days i had 100 200 and all so step by step india cannot have our bound rate is 40 so beyond 40 we cannot levy any duty so the most of the products under ita become zero day by day the uh, if you see the total uh, revenue collection in our country customs only contributes 7% the remaining are gst and direct tax so this is how the revenues are also going down um so the second barrier which can get created is non tariff barriers so what we have seen is tariff barriers by putting a high tariff you create a barrier for another country to enter into our country which we call it as tariff barriers by putting a non tariff barrier means for example very typically all of you have seen a small genset right for grass cutting lawn you would have seen some small genset the genset emits noise and also pollutes now china is producing this and it is coming into india i wanted to stop this how do i stop the duty currently is 7.5% is it possible for me to change the duty from 7.5 to 15% i can do it but i cannot do it i can do it but i won't do it what i will do i will put two barriers one is known as anti dumping duty if i know if i have proof that china is trying to dump in me i will invoke anti dumping duty or i can also invoke safeguard duty or i can put cvd this is another concept which is related to tariff to protect my domestic industry i can also invoke standards bas unless you meet and see you can import into my country 
But if you don't have a type approval, you take a sample and go and give it to CPCB, Central Pollution Control Board. They will send it to the authorized laboratory and they will examine the goods and they will tell you what kind of an emission permitted and what is your devices emitting. What kind of a noise is permitted and what noise the dB levels are coming out from this particular device. And if a standard is set by BIS and if China unable to comply to this standard, then that becomes a non-tariff barrier. So this is how government has powers to put tariff barriers. And the government is doing every fortnight you get quality control orders from BAS. If I wanted to import a nut and bolt and screw today, there is a quality control order. That particular nut needs to meet that IS standard. IS standards are defined by BAS. Uh, even when you see a drinking water, see, I have something like this, you, you know, what do you call uh, the moment you say bislery, we say it's bislery water, right? So for me, this is written as mineral, mineral water, okay, which means this water is taken directly from Himalayas. That's why they call it as minerals. Other water, what you see, aquafina, that is known as packaged water, packaged drinking water. All right. Now, if you just turn around, you will see here FSA license number, FSA, which means it is giving you permission. Yes, this is fit for consumption, FSA permission. Then you will also see one mark here called ISI. Can you see this ISI? Under that ISI, you will see one number, 145541 in your bottle. That is for packaged drinking water. In my number, it is something very different. I'm not able to see it. It's very small, so I couldn't see it. It's a very different number, 131 or something like that. So this is mineral water. So this IS numbers, what you see on the screen, is defined by BAS. So that water producing company needs to meet that standard. This is for water because we're consuming this, right? So likewise, for every product across the manufacturing side, they have created a standard, be it a cooker, be it a light, be it a cable, be it a tube light, everything there is a standard. So when you import, you also need to meet these standards. That is how we create a barrier. If there is no barrier, even we can get anything. The substandard quality also can come inside to our country, right? So that is why now India became a more protectionist country and trying to create left and right barriers to prevent China and other countries who are having wrong motives to spoil our economy. Uh, even if you see, uh, most of the people are thinking this Diwali made that you have not seen much crackers, right? One of the real reason is, you may not know this, you will not get it from the press. Everybody thought about, you know, people become very responsible, pollution con conscious. <laughs> it is not the reason. The dumping was stopped. The dumping was stopped. China is one culprit who used to dump at a cheap rate. Today, labor's uh, traders cannot buy it at that rate because of the restrictions what we have seen under the environmental related acts. So that is how the government uh, acts to control other countries are exploiting our market as well as to protect our domestic industry. That is how uh, non-tariff barriers are being used. So I hope you understood the difference between a tariff barrier and a non-tariff barrier. Question is, there are two things. One is the tariff barriers, which you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Anti-dumping, you said CBD and the safety. What is the safety thing you said? Oh, safeguard duty. Safeguard SD. duty, fine. Yes. fine. Safe, safe, no. Safeguard duty. And these are the three instruments which we do it. Uh, if you want to read about it, you can just go to Customs Tariff Act 1975. Customs Tariff Act 1975. There you have section 8, section 9. It's a small 13 acts, 13 sections only there. So 9, 9A talks about anti-dumping duty, safeguard duty, 8. And uh, you can read about CBD and additional duties. All these duties will be uh, understood, very easily understood. So I think we are done with the question. So thank you so much for such an insightful webinar. It was really a great learning experience. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.